Okay, here we are, right now. My name is Dosta, and this is another episode, another conversation, some more words to share. And today, I'd like us to talk about equality. (laughs) Oh my goodness, are we really going to go there? Well, yes we are. And let's think this through, let's talk about this. Let's really map this out and really get into a deeper understanding and really figure out how it is that these things sit within us. And the, the approach I'd like us to take is to really have two main things that we're contending with. One is our emotions, and another is our psychology. And on the emotional side, we have our feelings. We have bodily sensations. We have the phenomenon that is occurring within our immediate presence, our immediate self. What is happening to us, in a way of speaking? And on the psychology side, we have the story in our head. We have the things that we say, the things that we talk about, both out loud with other people and internally to ourselves. And there are a lot of different ways we can divvy that up. We can talk about the social sphere. We can talk about our private psychology or our private narrative, the things that we wouldn't say to anyone else, but we do think. And there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can sort that out to make it neat and to really understand all the complexes of what we're looking at and what we have within us. And this word, this word, equality, it's such a big word. It's such a triggering word in so many ways. And I think as we discuss this, it will become clear why it's so triggering, why it's so deep, why it hits on nerves so quickly and so easily. And ultimately, really what we're getting at with this conversation is, what about you? What's your stance? How does it feel for you? How do you make sense of it? How do you live with it? And I mean it in the broadest sense. I mean your place in the world, how the world is, how other people are, the situations that we are in and other people are in, and all the rest of it. It is really, in a nutshell, what you are. What are you? And equality, really, as we are talking about it today, as I feel we should go into it, gets at all of those things. So, there are a few words, a few key words that I'd like to define and discuss, and then there are a few measurement gauges, or yardsticks, as we could call them, for getting up a bit of a picture of equality, and really going into this as a subject, And there are also race, culture, and creed metrics that we'll get into. We'll also look at a sort of two-sided emotional profile blueprint where we can go through and talk about, okay, well, where are these emotions sitting and what triggers these emotions? And then also, what is the opposite of these emotions or what's the underlying cause of that emotion, if we were to really go into it and flip it around to its, should we say, positive form, then what would that look like? So that's the emotional side. And then for the bulk of this conversation, I want us to really have, I I want us to take our time to go through and actually build this picture of where you sit. And we're going to do that by creating let's say we create six or seven or eight profiles of people in your life. And we'll discuss them. We'll discuss the profiles. We'll discuss their qualities. 
And you'll be able to think of certain people in your life that fit into each of the profiles. And you'll start to see how equality sort of has its place in it, it's really it's really beyond words what we're trying to get at it's this sort of you you'll sort of get this picture you'll sort of get this this sense of where you're sitting within the larger web so if we say you're sitting within a network or gaia or we're all connected right that sort of talk well making these profiles and populating them with people in your life will help to flesh out that picture and really understand where it is that you sit and we can also look at towards the end i'd like to offer up a picture of equality which is a little bit radical and i think it will help to explain a lot of the way things are and why things are and what we can do about it i mean let's maybe leave this whole thing of what should we do about it on the back bench for now and let's look at more just understanding where we're at that's really what i want to spend the bulk of this conversation doing so that's our conversation for today let's get into it i believe the i sort of feel sometimes the <laughs> the beginnings are always so long that we can't work out well where is the real beginning so i guess every moment is a new beginning and we're beginning this conversation afresh and anew as we go deeper into it anyway, which I guess could be said of all things. So let's look at some words which are important to understand. And they're complex words that have many meanings and function in many different ways. And the first word that comes to mind for me when I hear about equality is this word quixotic so this means you're being idealistic in a way that is extravagant and over the top and unrealistic it's like well we should all live in a perfect world right we should just live in a world where everyone is happy Everyone gets what they want, everyone gets what they need, and we all get along in some sort of glorious euphoria of heavenly state or something or other like that, right? That's, that's the quixotic vision, and that's this word quixotic. When you say someone is being quixotic, you, mean, you can say, well, well, everyone should have equal rights, or everyone should have this, everyone should have that, and you say, well... Okay, great. Yes, that is a good idea, but let's be realistic about it. And in this, you get the real brute of the issue. You real you get the real the real the real tension of it, the real drama of it, which is that you have this thing in your mind about the way things should be, and that comes up against reality. Often with a stark contrast, a brutal contrast, a hurtful, yeah, it's, it's the dark side of humanity that we have to get into in order to bridge that. And that's really what we're trying to, in a way, resolve or not resolve, but at least understand. So understand that being quixotic is not something that you say, okay, we do away with it because it's unrealistic. We still need a quixotic part of us, which says, well, we should do this, we should do this, and we should be like this. Like if you sit anyone down and you say, well, how, how could things be better? How would things be if we could just improve them, even if it's just a little bit? If you sit anyone down, they would have an answer to that. They would have an idea, and they would be able to come up with certain things which are good which are right. And then on the other side, you don't want to be someone who just says, well, it's unrealistic. Where's the reality of it? Because these two sides work together, this idea of a vision of how things could be and working with reality, or in some ways working against reality or against the 
against entropy or against things being broken or things degrading or things breaking down, it's like, well, understand both of those sides. And the next word that's key to this is idealistic, which is very similar to quixotic, because you say it's idealistic to have this idea which can't be brought into reality. And the real crux of it is that you need both sides of this. To be idealistic is to have a mechanism of thought within you which can be used to propel certain things towards a greater good, towards a better world. And yet also, the pathological version of idealistic is that you have this idea which is actually bringing you into a kind of hurt state yourself. It's like a fool's errand or a fool's job or a hopeless cause or a lost cause, which fighting in and working for brings nothing but hurt because the actual fight for it is so much more hurt that you don't really need, you don't really want to be working with, you don't want to really have to suffer. So that's idealistic. And like all mechanisms of thought, it has its, it has its positive processes, it has its purpose, and it has its pathologies. Now, we come to the last word, which is similar to idealistic, which is ideology. When we talk about ideology, now it seems like ideology is sort of one of those buzzwords in philosophy at the moment. Ideology, ideology. And for me, what I think about when we have ideology, or this word ideology, we say, okay, you have this idealistic thing, and then you have the story that goes with that. And that's basically the, the etymology of this word, ideology. Ideal, ology. Ideal is the best idea you've got, and ology means story, as in ornithology or anthropology or mythology and all the rest of it, or even psychology. Ology words means the story about. And here's a little way it might work. Here's a way that it might happen. You say... Okay, so I'm, I'm sitting in my room, I'm by myself, and there's no one else around, and I say, okay, well, let me be a bit quixotic, and let me be a bit idealistic, and I say, well, what would be a way to improve the situation? And I come up with an idea, and I start working on it, and I work on it to some degree, with some success, and it sort of works. I sort of figure out that, well, okay, this is how I can improve things. Now, someone comes along and they see what I am doing. And I can explain to them, well, the reason I'm working this way, the reason I'm doing these things is because I've got this idea of how things would be better. And maybe you can see the results. Maybe you can see my condition. Maybe you can see what I've done. And you can say, well, that looks pretty good. How did you do that? What's going on there? There's something positive to learn here. There's something good that I can get from this. Now, we're going to sit down and we're going to talk. I'm going to tell you my idea. I'm going to tell you how I'm going about doing it. I'm going to tell you what sort of things I'm working on, what sort of challenges I've got. And if you're on board, then you'll be on board. Now, as soon as there's two people involved, it becomes an ideology because we both have this story. It's gone from one person's narrative to two people holding the same narrative. And from here, we have an ever expanding scale because from two people, we can add three people and from three people, we can add four people and so on, until we have millions and millions of people on our cause. Yes, we're trying to take over the world. <laughs> well, 
not at least here, we're not, but in some ideologies around the world. That's what it seems to look like, right? Trying to take over the world. These religions, these civilizational mechanisms of understanding, ideologies, they're really just things that are trying to take over the world. And it becomes complex, it becomes pathological, it becomes something that is self-destructive because the story can overtake any sort of goodness and any sort of connection to how reality is. It can lose all of its grounding in such a way that it can become destructive. And it has done that in so many ways. That's why ideology has such a bad name. When you think of the word ideology, I think a lot of people have this thing of, well, you're a religious fundamentalist, or you're a neo-Nazi, or you're a white supremacist, or you're an oppressive this, that, and the other other. And that's really ideology gone wrong. That's ideology taken so far out of what it was really initially meant to be that it's destructive. And these ideologies do need to be deconstructed. They need to be understood for the, path for the pathological things that they do, for the way that they hurt individuals. Because you can say, say we go back to our story of, okay, you and me with our story of what we're working on. Now, the third person that comes along, we're going to tell them the story, but they might not exactly see so much as to why it is that we're working on the things that we're working. And that loss of the initial reason for the story, for the cause, is ever more difficult to not have happen when you're talking about more and more people. The more people that are involved, the more complex it is. And really, the problems with so many of the large civilizational ideologies is that they don't account for the amount of people that they have in an accommodating way. Now, there's a way around this, which is that you say, this ideology is correct, and the people that don't agree with it or adhere to it are incorrect and they're wrong. And that's one way an ideology actually works in that there's more people than it initially realized it had to deal with. And this is a complex, rich, vast history. I mean, this is the history of the humanities. And if you want to study the humanities, you can go into that. You can talk about all sorts of things, which are the implications and the ramifications of ideology. But what's important for us is to understand the immediate personal origins of ideology, which is that we have this reality that we, we are in, and things could be better. Now, as for our personal situation, as to gauges of how things could be better, and this is where we come back to equality and understanding our differences, I've got a few things here that are sort of the ABC measurements of equality. And this is by no means an extensive list. This is just some of the ones that come to mind. And let's talk about them and notice which ones of these are closer to home for you than others. Because, because some of these will resonate more than others, depending on what you're like, what your issues are, and what you've got going on in your life. Now, 
The first one, some way, in some ways a very obvious one, is money. Not everyone has the same amount of money. Some people have more than others. Now, another gauge is intelligence. Some people are more intelligent than others. And along with intelligence, we have cognitive ability and education. And you can see, I can feel already, there's, there's this fire, there's this, it, it's almost like outrage, it's this injustice. And I'm feeling it myself just by saying this, because you can look at this intelligence and education, and you can say, well, what about someone who's more intelligent, but doesn't have the education they should have had? Isn't that just something that boils your blood? Isn't that just something that is, well, it's, in, it's inequality. It's injustice. And to think that this is the world we're living in re really hurts. It, it sucks. It really sucks. And how about this one? Quality of living conditions. Now, some people have certain amounts of money, but that is different to the quality of their living conditions. Where you live, the sort of house you live, how much dust is in it, how clean the streets are, how fresh the air is, how many rodents and pests you have, how much rubbish is around, how big the house is, whether it has air conditioning or not, what sort of weather, what sort of yearly weather is there, how populated it is, how spacious it is, how new it is. These are all things that are to do with the quality of your living conditions. Now, of course, I'm talking just environmental here. We could talk psychological and social and spiritual as well. But let's just keep it simple. Let's just make it, you know, just quality of air, just quality of the things that are around you. Now, everyone has differences in that. Everyone has a kind of inequality in that. Now, here we go for this next one, which is a big one. And this next gauge is sex. Now, initially, I thought of this in sort of two ways, because we can say there's sex as in the sex act of having sex, and then there's sex as in gender. And for so long in the public sphere now, in recent times, this has been a point of contention. It's a point of it's a point of argument. It's a point where people get uptight. And I can understand why people get uptight. I can understand why there's so much hurt in gender understand understanding or I, I don't really have the right words for it. It's It's like this, well, you know, I don't know what it's like. I don't know what it's like. I wish I did. I wish I did understand more. And I mean, if I can talk personally, it's like, well, how does it feel to be a boy? That's the question. How does it feel to be a man? That's really the key question. And if you ask someone who's a different gender, well, you say, well, how does it feel to be a woman? How does it feel to be a girl? And if you ask someone who's transge transgender, you say, well, how does it feel to be transgender? Or how does it feel to be some other gender? And in that answer, 
you have the differences between us and the real answer to understanding this i believe comes in with the emotions which we'll talk about a little later on and it's not exactly clear to me it's a tricky one i think it's i think it's always going to be tricky and to circle back again about sex i mean i see these initially as two separate things gender and the sexual act but i can also see as i've thought about it some more that they are related and the question of sex is well are you having sex or not that's the question that gets at it and if you're having sex you can say well is it good sex or not and you could really even order this as a kind of gauge of the classes right it's almost like a class gauge the people who are having sex and the people who aren't having sex and the people who are having sex but it's not really very good sex you're not really enjoying it as much as sex can be enjoyed because maybe you're not with your ideal partner maybe your relationship isn't quite good i mean we can bring the whole relationship thing into it as well right the world is divided into those with a relationship and those without and you can say well that's the case until you get a relationship then the world is divided into those with a fruitful relationship and those with a toxic relationship <laughs> so it depends on where you're sitting <laughs> how you divide the world but this is another way of seeing our differences this is another thing that we have to contend with in the world of equality. So sex and gender that's that's not entirely clear to me. I think we will we'll have to circle back to that when we get to the emotions. Now, next gauge is opportunity. Some people have more opportunity than others. They have opportunities of jobs, opportunities of education, opportunities of recreational activities, opportunities of access to institutions, opportunities of attending social functions and social gatherings. And sort of another side of this is mobility or class mobility. And we can say class mobility as in how much money you earn. And then there's also the mobility through all the others, right? There's, there's a mobility in education. There's a mobility in quality of living conditions. If you're in a certain country which simply does not have the infrastructure needed for improved quality of living conditions, you have no mobility. You have no way to improve your living conditions. There's no way to improve, there's no way to make that better because it simply doesn't exist in your country. It's simply not there. Now, some countries do have increased ability to improve the living conditions of its citizens more than others and you can say the same about all the rest of them about your job about how much money you make about your education and all the rest I mean living condition conditions is just one example now next gauge now this is where we get a little bit personal I feel which is creativity and we can lump industriousness in with that which is that some people are more creative than others. Some people naturally make things. Some people naturally build things. Some people have more ideas than others. And then we have the next gauge, which is 
social skills or human connection. Have you noticed this in your social circles? Have you noticed this in the people in your life? Some people just know how to connect well. They know how to speak about themselves. They know how to speak clearly. They know how to form relationships, to build rapport, to build trust, and generally just to connect with people. And some people really struggle with it. Some people have mistrust and anxiety and nervousness and fear surrounding their ability to just be in a room with someone and talk and have a conversation, to socialize, to say, hey, what's your story? What's your life? And of course, there are mechanisms that work with this. I mean, you can say that there are therapeutic uh, mechanisms or there are sort of social mechanisms like learning to talk to others and connect with others is not just necessarily a it's not just necessarily therapy but it's also you know like there's a whole thing of going out and learning to socialize which I really wouldn't categorize as a kind of therapy but in a way maybe it does come back to therapy because you're you're coming back to you know why is it that you're afraid to Share yourself. Why is it that you're afraid to meet new people? And there's something very beautiful in all that, in all those mechanisms, in those techniques. When you actually see someone learn those things and you see the journey they go through for actually confronting their fears and coming out of their social anxiety and actually learning how to talk in a meaningful way with others, that, that, that's incredibly beautiful. That's in, incredibly important. And you could say, well, damn, man, you had to do all that therapy and spend all that money and spend all that time just so that you could learn to be comfortable to have a conversation with someone at the bar or at the cafe. Whereas most people just say, well, that's just how it is. And some people go even further, right? Right. Maybe this can be one of those ones that we put into our scale. In fact, all of these will be ones that we put into our scale when we're looking at the different profiles. But social skills and human connection is just one of those gauges. So, and the last one on the list that I've got for today, which is by no means the last gauge that we can slap onto measurements of equality, is... Family upbringing. Now, you could say, you're lucky to have a family. You're lucky to have a happy family. Some people would say, you're lucky to have a family at all. And it's just for us, at this point in the conversation, to acknowledge that, like all the other things... Some people have better family upbringings than others. That is a cold, hard fact. We all have a different family upbringing. And we also all feel differently about it. We all feel, we all say different things about it. It has a different effect on us. And this is why there's no real science to this. There's no real way of actually saying, okay, well, how do we actually measure this? There's no, there's no way you can measure this because you could say, okay, well, let's look at your family and let's look at my family and we'll say, well, who had the better family upbringing? But that wouldn't work at all because you would say, well, maybe objectively or subjectively in whatever way we say, I had a better family upbringing than you but I might not feel very good about it. I might not feel very happy about it. I might still blame my family for things. I might still have resentment towards my family. I might still hold grudges against my family. And you might look at the, them and say, well, my goodness, how can you hold such a grudge for such a small thing? How can you hold such resentment for so much 
that has happened so long ago that was really not that bad. And I can look at you and I'll say, well, damn, your family was pretty tough on you. Your family situation as as your childhood was really hard. Where's your resentment? Where's your hurt? How do you feel towards your family? And you might say, well, I actually feel very good about them. I'm thankful for my family. I have gratitude towards my family. I feel warm when I think of my family. I feel very happy for the childhood that I had, even though it was hard. Even though I had to undo a lot of the hurt. Even though I had to do so much healing. And of course, it's right about now that you start to see the bridge. Because for us to be in that situation, when we're talking about our families, and actually listening to each other, and empathizing with each other, and being open, well, we're both learning about our differences in equality. We're both starting to see each other's sides of the story. And in that conversation, something very positive would happen. And we could have that kind of conversation with all of these gauges. We could say, well, how do you feel about socializing? How do you feel about your social skills? How do you feel about your creativity? Do you wish you were more creative? Do you wish you were less creative? (laughs) Do you wish you could just stop with all the ideas for once? (laughs) And how do you feel about your mobility? How do you feel about your education? How do you feel about your sex? How do you feel about your relationships, your intimate relationships? How do you feel about your gender? And understanding and listening to one another is one of the most powerful things if not the most powerful things that we can do to combat inequality and to really contend with equality. Now, there is something I need to mention to this thing of gauges, which is that there needs to be something in this list which is not a gauge. We need to be able to say that there are certain things that can't be gauged because to say that a human being is their money, their intelligence, their quality of living conditions, their sex, their mobility, their creativity, their social skills, their family upbringing, and that's it, is not enough. That's so narrow in so many ways. It's so... It, it's it's too much like the psychologist is just analyzing you, right? There's some there's something distasteful about it, because you never you never really go to people like that. I mean, if you're really open to people, you don't you don't go up to someone and you say, "Well, how much money do you earn? Are you currently having sex? How do you feel about being a woman? How do you feel about being a man? Where did you study at school? You know, like that that sort of con- that sort of conversation. It's very it's very distasteful. It's very, it's lacking in any sort of real substance. And and I'm sure you know there's there's these funny skits, right? You can have this. This must have been in the movie so many times, right? When the guy wants to take out the the girl, and he goes to the father to say, "Oh, can I take out your daughter? Or can I marry your daughter? Whatever." Some some version of that skit, some version of that story, and the father basically does that list, right? He says, well, where's your education? Where's your money? And so the rest of it. And it's like, in that moment, the reason that skit is such a reaction to the person in the audience because is because you're, set, you're thinking, no, but he loves her. They really know each other. They're in love. You don't understand, right? And of course, you know that because you know the rest of the story. And the father, or whoever it is, doesn't know that because they're playing the character in the story. And there's a version of that skit in so many stories, in so many versions, in so many movies. And that's what's going on there because you can't measure 
people with a ruler, with a measuring tape, with a yardstick. And that's something to keep in mind. That's something to understand. And and I say that knowing that you still need to work in these gauges somehow. So the the tenth gauge is no gauge, we could say. And that doesn't mean to do away with all the other gauges. It just means that we need to be aware of what's going on there. It's a kind of paradox. It's a kind of contradiction of the picture that we're using, the picture that we're building. Now, let's get into some of the emotions. I'm going to take a swig of water. Let's talk about some of the emotions. And some of these emotions have already come up. This will make things a bit more clear. Now, on the negative side, we have outrage. We have injustice. And yes, injustice is an emotion. The emotion of injustice. We have envy. We have jealousy. We have disappointment. We have bitterness. These are the negative emotions. These are the dark emotions. And if you really look at equality, it's so easy to fall into these. And you can do it through the whole way. You can do it in in you, you could do it in every way you can imagine. Someone has more money than you, how outrageous. It's so easy to be bitter towards someone who has more money than you. Why should someone have more money than you? Why? And you say, well, it's because they worked harder. And it's like, well, no. It's because of their situation. It's because of structural things. It's because of their education. It's because of things that are out side of their control in so many ways. And of course, with that outrage, you would say, well, well, how would you feel if we gave you some more money? And I don't want to take this sort of, it's not like, it's not right to say, well, let's make this a sort of smart aleck, sort of put it back in your face thing. It's better to be like, how do I say this? What what am I imagining? I'm imagining, say you take someone who has a sort of bitterness towards someone who has more money than them. And you say, well, would you like more money? And the answer is, well, yes. Because the fact of the matter is that more money does make life easier. It does bring more opportunity. And that's, I sort of feel a bit uncomfortable about saying that. I feel like there's a lot in that that is not being said that can't be said. And yet it's true, right? As someone who's been very poor at times and very desperate at times, I can definitely say that, well, it's easier to have more money. And that's just one gauge, right? Like, look at intelligence. Look at sex. Jealousy and sex, they go hand in hand. When we talk about jealousy, there's no more potent version of jealousy than someone who is having sex. And this is the classic story. I mean, the, the ABC version of this or the cartoon version of this is the guy's having sex with the hot girl and he's an asshole, and he's a real idiot. He's a real buffoon. He's just got nothing going for him. And a good man comes along and it's just like, well, damn, 
What is wrong with the world? And you could say, well, there's a whole psychology going on there, Dosta. And the reason it's that way is because of a whole bunch of dominance things and power things and all the rest of it. And we could get into that. We could say that. But that doesn't nullify the inequality. It doesn't nullify the differences. Now, for the other side of emotions, if we have all our negative ones of outrage, jealousy, and disappointment and bitterness, well, there's another side to it, which is the positive side. And this side is things like celebration, things like encouragement, or the feeling of joy in someone else's success, in someone else's flourishing. And then there's also acknowledgement, or giving credit where credit is due, which is similar to celebration, right? Celebration is saying, okay, something good has happened, so we all feel really good for some time. And because we feel good, we make balloons and put on party hats and throw streamers. That's acknowledgement and celebration. They really go hand in hand. And then there's hope. Hope is a positive emotion. And you can apply these to all of the gauges that we have for equality, for inequality. And you can notice when those emotions are triggered in you and why it is that you feel that way. Now, if this is a little bit abstract, don't worry because we'll get into some of the profiles. We're going to do a, a personal, what do we call it? We're going to do a bit of a spectrum here, which will help to tie all this together. So we've got our gauges of equality and we've got our emotions and we've got those two sides that sort of interact with each other and go back and forth and weave in and out. And now what I'd like us to do is to tie it together by going through different people in your life who sit in different places. And try and make this as personal as possible because it's so easy to it's so easy for this sort of conversation to become like this far off lofty philosophical talk, right? It's just ideas about equality or talk about culture or talk about the rich people, right? How do we just talk about the rich people or the people who are so much better than us, apparently, who really aren't better than us? Well, we can see where that lies, right? We can see where that kind of thinking ends up, right? Let's bring it back to earth and let's make it more personal. And let's really empower this sort of personal understanding responsibility. And there, there is a solution to all this, I should say. There is a way to actually contend with all of these things that we're tying together. So let's build this picture. So what we've got is we've got you. We've got you and your situation. So make that, make that clear. How much money do you have? How do you feel about your money? Your wealth? How much intelligence do you have? Are you an intelligent person? Do you have a high cognitive ability? Are you smart? And how do you feel about your education, your knowledge, your wisdom? And just assess your living conditions. Would you say you have good living conditions? Could your living conditions be better? Could they be worse? And now take a look at your sex. Are you having sex? Is it good sex? 
Are you getting enough sex? And along with that, look at your gender. How does it feel to be a man or a woman? How does it feel to be a boy or a girl? Or some other gender? How does it feel to be transgender? And now take a look at your opportunity. Do you feel like you have opportunities for things? Take a look at your take a look at your creative energies. Take a look at your your ability to build things, to make things. Now take a look at your social skills. How do you assess yourself? Are you someone who's very social? Are you someone who you feel can connect deeply with other people? And take a look at your family upbringing. Take a look at your family background. How do you feel about your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your grandparents, your uncles, aunties, nephews, nieces, and all the rest of it? And just sense this assessment that you've done of yourself. Sense how this is, where you sit within these things. And also leave some room for some of the other things in your life. Don't try and squeeze yourself into this narrow analysis, this simple psychology. Really just get a feeling of how you are in your life. Now imagine someone who's about the same as you. Now this is probably someone who you would call a friend. This is someone who is probably known to you personally quite well, right? Chances are. I'd say it's a high chance. Someone who you call your best friend or your close friend is probably someone who in a lot of ways is just similar to you. It's just easier to be friends with someone who's similar to you. Now imagine someone who is slightly better than you. By whatever gauge. Someone you can look at and you can say, well, they're better off than me in some ways. Maybe not in all ways. Maybe just in some ways. But you can see they're getting along in life better than I am. Now, chances are you do know people personally that you could actually say that about. And you might not call them a close friend. You might call them an acquaintance. You might be just someone that you see around. And now we go the other way and we say, think of someone who's slightly worse than you. Think of someone who, by either some of these gauges or other gauges, or just generally, is not quite as good off as you. They're sort of just struggling their way. And it's not like they're struggling their way in that it's unbearable for them. It's just that you wouldn't trade places with them because you can see, well, you're pretty much comfortable compared to them. Now let's go the other way. Let's go, we go back to the, the better than you and imagine someone who is a lot better than you. Someone who is in the situation where it's immediately obvious that they are better than you. They might be better looking than you. They have more money than you. They're clearly smarter than you. 
And you can imagine you might not know where they live, but they live in a nicer place than you. And you can see this, really, quite easily when you're comparing yourself to other people in your chosen field. So when you're talking about, like, a scene or a career or a community, and you say, well, there are certain people who are just way better than you. Say, for example, if you're a musician and there's someone who plays the same instrument as you, and it's just obvious in so many ways that they are way better than you. And you could say, well, well, they're older than me. Or they've, they've had more practice than me or whatever. You, can might, <laughs> you could sort of make some excuse for it, right? But here you see that there's something that becomes impersonal. There's something that becomes sort of like, well, it's okay that he's better or he or she is better. And I'm sort of getting this image now of Lisa Simpson, which is this cartoon where she's playing the saxophone, right? Because Lisa Simpson plays jazz saxophone and someone turns up at school and she's better than her at saxophone. And, and Lisa's sort of like, oh, we're going to be just great friends because we play the same instrument. And it's like, you know, in that moment, they're going to be enemies. And then it's like, she goes, it's something, I can't remember the exact story, but basically it turns out that she's not only better at saxophone than her, but she's also smarter than her because Lisa's also really smart at books and studying and things like that. And it's like, damn, you know, you meet these people and you think, well, okay, so you're better than me at saxophone, but at least I'll beat you in the, in the English essay sort of thing. And it's like, well, no. They're actually going to beat you at that as well. And it's like, damn, that person is better than me at that as well. And you know people like this. There are people like this in your life. And if we look at it the other way, we can say, well, there are people that are a lot worse than you in every way. And it might be that you don't notice these people. It might be that you don't really talk much to these people. Because the further we get out on this spectrum, the further we go with these profiles, chances are the more impersonal it becomes to you. And imagine someone, imagine someone who you just have more money than. Imagine someone you're just smarter than, someone you're just better, maybe you're better at saxophone than them. You, can just, you could just be like, oh, you're learning the saxophone, that's cute. And it's sort of it's sort of this thing in, in jazz jam sessions, right? Like who can outdo the next person? You can turn it into a sort of boisterous competition sort of thing. Like who is better than who? Like that game of who is better than who, that's that's such an old game. That's an ancient game that has been around for centuries. I'm sure it's been around for millennia. And the question is, well, how do you feel about the people? that you're a lot better than? Do you gloat? Do you show off? Does it give you a sense of pride? And what would it be like to understand that in a way that is compassionate? What would it be like to acknowledge someone that's trying? Acknowledge that someone in so many ways is not as good as you, but is still of great worth. They're still a human being. They're still an individual. And it's not that you would say, well, you know, you're better, I'm better than you at this, but you might be better at something else. Well, you don't even need to say that. You don't even need to make it a game of better and worse. You really need to step out of that whole game. You really need to drop the whole game of better and worse in that situation. And now let's go to the furthest reaches of our spectrum. Let's make this, these profiles as extreme as we can. So we need two people. We need one that's better than you and one that's worse than you. 
and they both need to be off the charts. All right. So let's start with let's start with the one that's better than you. Now, in some ways, this is where we get into celebrity culture, right? Because it might be that you haven't personally met someone who is better than you in these sort of gauges. And for me, I mean, I, I have someone in my life who, well, they're not in my life. I mean, I met the person, I think I met this person once or twice at a conference and this person was Sam Prince. So Sam Prince is a serial entrepreneur and he's got a net worth of something like $300 million and he founded this successful chain of fast food restaurants. So there's something like 160 fast food restaurants that he owns and franchises. And he also works in medical research and apparently he's got something that is a patent that's once it's developed and once it's out, it's going to be worth something like a billion dollars or something. He's going to be, you know, one of these huge, hugely successful people. And, you know, he founded this fast food chain when he was in medical school, right? It was just like his sort of part-time job, you know, when people, when people often get a part-time job for paying their way through uni, he was actually founding an entire chain, right? Like that gives you some idea of how successful he is. And you could say, well, damn, you know, like that's just so successful. I mean, you can't even imagine what sort of life goes with living in that sort of company and living with that sort of money. I mean, he wakes up every day and he works on his companies and there are people doing what he says. There are people following his decisions and all the rest of it. I mean, he's got his personal assistant. He's got his personal chef. He's got his personal trainer. He's got his whole team. He's got his travel schedule. He's got media that he does every now and then. He's got conferences to go to. He's got talks to go to. He's got awards to accept. I mean, I can't, I can't even imagine, right? I don't even know what sort of life that is. I really have no idea. I mean, that's, that's the question he always gets asked, right? What sort of life do you live or what sort of day do you do? What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? And I heard, this, I heard this thing about him, which was that there was this time when he was doing this sort of super routine, which was where he would wake up at 3 a.m., run to the gym do a one-hour gym workout, then go to work till midday, sleep for half an hour, and then work until midnight. Right? Unbelievable. Right? Talk about inequality. We can talk about energy levels. Right? How can someone have that much energy? How can someone work that much? And I've definitely felt like, well, damn, I should be doing that. I should have this super routine. I should be going hardcore. I should be making things. I should be building companies. Yeah, yeah. You know, like that whole, that whole attitude of like, wow, you know, you just, just to sort of sense someone's life like that. And you could say, well, damn, you're so successful, but you know, maybe you don't meditate. Maybe he doesn't understand meditation. You know, it's like, oh, at least I've got that one thing on him. And it's like, well, no, actually, he spent six months meditating. And also, he was raised as a Buddhist. So, actually, he's been doing Vipassana meditation at, since, a, since he was a kid, which is something you only learned in your late 20s. And it's like, well, damn, like, how, how successful can someone be? How off the charts can someone be? And that's someone for me, that's someone for me that is just the, the upper scale of inequality. And I admire the guy. I look up to the guy. I do feel, I don't feel bitter towards him. I mean, I wouldn't, 
I mean, it's so hard for me to imagine what his life is really like, right? It just becomes this thing like, well, you're just imagining what it would be like to be him and anything that you imagine would be so far devoid from reality that there's no real point entertaining it because you just, you know, there's just nothing anchoring that imagination. There's nothing to it. And yeah, it was great to to meet that guy. Sam Prince is his name, Dr. Sam Prince. And I only met him once or twice. And you sort of, he, he sort of had that thing about him of this ultra successful, ultra productive person, which was that he just had this, you know, people coming up to him all the time, people asking him questions and he was standing very still and he was sort of talking in this sort of, you know, like a prophet kind of speech and telling stories and yeah. And I mean, you, you, you sort of think like, well, what is it like for Elon Musk or what is it like for a Bill Gates? And you can say, well, the, these are the people that are measured in inequality by only a f certain number of gauges. And we'll get to that. There's another, there's another way around this, which we'll get to. But with that in mind, let's look at someone who's off the chart in the other way. And this would be the person that is really... really just they would look at you and they would see you as a kind of Sam Prince. I mean, the difference is that great, but in the other direction. And it might be that you haven't met someone like this. It's very rare, I think, to really be confronted by this because, you know, someone successful or someone who's at the top of the food chain, it's like, well, yeah, let's meet the person. Wow. Let's talk about the person. Let's see what they're saying. Let's like, wow, wow, you know, like, let's suck up to them on, and that sort of thing. And it's like, well, in the other direction, you say, oh, I don't want to know about that, you know. The person who's in poverty, the person who's dying, the person who's sick. It's like, well, who would, who would really want to choose to go towards that? Because it's so hurtful. It's so off-putting. And... I mean, I've had multiple experiences of this, and then there's one experience that I can remember, which is really quite burnt into my mind. It was quite a life experience, quite a shock. And, and I've had a few of these. It's happened a few times, but there's, there's this one time that I'll tell you about, which is that I was in New Delhi traveling and which is in India and I was walking around and I was confronted by a man who wanted money from me and I gave him money and he didn't speak English and I mean how do I go about describing this it's just like he had only the rags that he was wearing and he was covered in dust and he had missing teeth and a screwed up face and deformed feet and probably deformed hands as well. And it was clear that he was in a state of sheer desperation and it was clear that he lived in that state and the air around and the dust and the pollution and the muck and the rubbish and the dirt it was just overwhelming and he sort of grunted at me and pointed at me and it was like, well, obviously he wants some money, you know, like white guy in the middle of the city of New Delhi. It's so obvious. Like the, the inequality is so obvious just by the clothes that I was wearing. Like for me, it was just normal clothes, right? But for him, those are like fancy, clean Westerners clothes. 
that's something that is just this immediate massive difference. And I pulled out my wallet and I gave him some money and I realized that in my wallet I had enough cash to last probably two weeks accommodation and food as a tourist. And I realized that what I was giving him was a tiny portion of that and yet it would have to last him who knows how long. Weeks? Months? And it's like, well, you could say, well, how come you didn't give him more? How, didn't you, how come you didn't give him more money? And the issue of giving money to beggars, well, that's, that's a separate issue. That's really not what we're getting in here today. That's a story and that's a discussion for another day. Because you could, you could even argue that you're not even helping this person, right? There are certain paradigms that would say that you shouldn't give money to beggars. But, you know, that's never been my, my, that's never been my attitude. I've always given money to beggars when I've been in that situation. And, and, and you, but you can sense it, right? You can sense the injustice. You, you, like you can sense, it's, it's like a kind of anger. It's like this hurt. Like I felt that man's hurt. Like what, like why? Why have you got deformed hands? Why are you living in mud? Why are you living in mud? Why don't you have enough money for food? What is going on here? And and in that moment I was it was like I was Sam Prince. It was like I was this high level just super ultra successful white guy in the middle of New Delhi. And it's like, damn, like, like it brings a tear to my eye to think about that guy, to talk about that guy. And it's not like I could be friends with him, right? I mean, I, I live in Australia now. And that's really, really part of the, the difference, right? It's just that he's in that country, that he is that way. It's by no choice of mine that I was born here. It's by no choice of his that he was born here. And it's like, well, damn, how do we, how do we reconcile this? How do we make sense of the fact that there are people with billions of dollars who can literally buy what Ever they could possibly imagine. And there are people living in dust. And in so many ways, that's too simplistic a way to look at it. Because many of the people who are billionaires are actually doing work to alleviate poverty. So it's not exactly as simple as, oh, we've got people over here who just spend a whole bunch of money on themselves and people over here who are poor. It's not exactly like that at all because, well, people do work, people do help, people do send foreign aid, people do have institutions, people do have funds, people do have, uh, what, what do you call, what do you call an institution that's primarily for helping foreign aid? I've forgotten the word for it, but you know what I mean, right? It's not as, it's not as, it's not so simple to just say, well, there's inequality in the world and we need to make it the same for everyone. That doesn't get at it. That's not quite how it works. Because we're actually working with things that are bigger than any individual, right? When you're talking about economy or resources or export or innovation, or technology. These are things that are bigger than any one individual. Like, you just can't contend with those things. And maybe this is where we get into power, right? This is where we say, well, who has the power? Is money power? Is money the thing that gets things done? 
And I don't know if it's for me to really say. I mean, the answer that I have for all of this is to actually come back to your individual situation and sense that thing that is really bigger than that. And here's where we get into those gauges which are off the charts. Here's where we learn about the people who have something which is beyond the material. They have a certain something which is worth more than being successful by any measure. It's even worth more than intelligence. It's even worth more than your life conditions. And it's that thing which is really hard to put words to. We could call it self-knowledge. We could call it the ability to know what you are. We could call it existential realization. We could call it being one with God. We could call it being one with existence. We could call it being infinite. Right? These sorts of phrases, these sorts of words sort of get at it. Like if you're, like if you're infinite, how much money you have just becomes like this petty little sort of thing, right? You, you sort of just forget about money. Along with intelligence and sex and opportunity and creativity and social skills and family upbringing, right? Along with all of it. And that's not to say that these people who have an extraordinary level of infinity or realization of infinity don't have power. On the contrary, they have, they have more power. They have a better ability to make things happen in the world for the better because they have more people working for them. They have, because they have a better ideology. They have better ideals. They have a better story of how things should be. So people get on board with them. And there is a way that you can find that for yourself. There is a way that you can let go of this whole thing of, oh, why can't I be more successful? Because it reeks of desire, right? This thing of more, more, more. I want, I want, I want. That is such a tiresome game. Such a delusional game. It's such a hurtful game in so many ways. And to step off the wheel of desire is to realize that you're infinite. And believe me, I wish we could live in a world and, and it's not really enough for me to say I wish. You know, I take that back. I don't wish it. I, I say that we should live in a world where every human being deserves the best that humanity has. And not only deserves it, but that can have it. We should live in a world where everyone has as much money as they want. We should live in a world where people should be able to buy fancy cars, to have fancy cars, to have the sports car, to have the luxury car, to have the luxury house, to travel, to see things, to eat fancy foods, to live well. People should be able to live their life, and, I'm, and I mean this quite seriously, people should be able to live their life without working at all. If you don't want to work, you don't have to work. 
It should be the robots that work. There should be no one in service jobs unless they want to. It should be the robots that do that. And we have the technology, right? We have the ability to do so much. It's just that it's not widespread. There's always a trickle out process to these things. And we could even say this about what it means to be born. We could even put this onto your actual body, your physical limitations. This would be the, the inequality of our bodies. Now, in Australia, we have dog breeding laws. And if you want to breed dogs, you actually need a license and you need to pay money and you need to go through a whole bunch of paperwork. And there are certain breeds that you can't breed. Now, there's many reasons for this, most of which I don't understand. But one of the reasons we have this regulation is because if you breed a certain kind of dog with a, another certain kind of dog, the pup that's going to come from that is going to have certain birth defects. They're going to have certain things wrong with them. And it would be cruel to that puppy for it to be born with those defects when we know it would be born with those defects. And is now the time when I say that we should be doing that for humans? Is now the time when I say that, well, people should be born in a similar sort of way? Well, it's a tricky one, isn't it? And it's another one of those things which has a lot of misunderstanding around it and a lot of flared emotions and a lot of conflicting beliefs. And maybe the whole thing of population control and birth control is a conversation for another day. I believe that's a, I believe that is a big conversation. I believe that's there's more in that than than we can say just today. So let me just mention it here, and just think about the dog breeding laws in Australia. And of course, it's not like that in other countries, right? In other countries. Dogs just roam the streets and there's an overpopulation problem and there's too many dogs and there's no one to take care of them and they're in a terrible condition. I mean, it's not just humans that have these rough living conditions and extreme poverty. It's also the animals. It's also many animals. And of course, would you not say that it would be better if these beings didn't suffer like this. Like surely we can agree on that. Surely we can agree that less suffering is better, right? No matter what your ideology, no matter what your story, no matter what your ideas, no matter what your beliefs, we can agree that less suffering is better. Now, I think we've covered off just about everything. I feel like I haven't made enough of a stab at self-knowledge. I don't know if I'm really hitting that point hard enough or clearly enough. And maybe we'll talk about it again in another day. And by going through this, I've, I hope that you've got this sense of where you sit and just with that, I hope that you can see, well, the knowledge of where you sit changes how you feel about where you sit. There's this thing of the more you understand your place in the world, the more comfortable you are with it, which then also leads you on to being able to change it. And... 
Just think about it some more. I mean, think about the people that are slightly better than you, or slightly worse than you, or a lot better than you, or a lot worse than you. And think about some of those people who are off the charts. Try and meet some of those people. Try and meet a celebrity. Try and meet a super entrepreneur. I mean, I, I don't know if meeting them would really tell you much. I mean, maybe it will tell you something about them, maybe not. And try and meet also people, those ones that are a lot worse off than you. Meet someone who's in poverty. I mean, that can be a spiritual practice, right? Actually going and surrounding yourself with those in poverty as a way of opening up to your difference. That's really that's really how you become a, a like deeply grateful, right? You can you can say something spiritual like, "Oh, you know, be more grateful for the life that you have." And it's like, okay, well, okay, like that doesn't give me anything. What am I supposed to do with that? There's there's nothing in that. Okay, okay, so what? But the practice for that is to say, well, surround yourself with someone who's worse off or compare yourself to someone who's worse off and do it experientially. Like don't just, don't just think about it, actually do it. And really that's the thing about practice, isn't it? It's that you have to do something that's very hard to do so that the quality or the virtue will break onto you. Like to have gratitude break onto you. Like that's a big thing. That's a heavy thing. That's going to take a lot of hard lifting to get that one afloat. So, yeah, those are some ideas. I think, I think there's probably more to this conversation than we've said today. But at least that's a start. At least that's something to work with. And I don't think outrage is the solution. I don't think anger or injustice or envy or disappointment or bitterness is something that should be acted upon. And it's also, these are also emotions that shouldn't be downplayed. Like I can really see both sides of it. I can really see why people become outraged in the differences and there is so much hurt and I think really the solution is for us all to come together and to understand our differences, to understand our hurts, understand the things we've overcome, the things we've achieved and to celebrate those things, to be more compassionate towards one another to be more open to one another and to realize we live in a world where no one should have to suffer the way they are. And that compassion, that feeling, really in a deep way comes back to love. How can we love each other? And how can we work with love and work from love to making this world a better place, to improving the problems that we have, to finding the solutions we need. So those are some thoughts for now. And I still, I still feel like there's more to say. I can't say that this is all we have to say on this subject, but this is at least a start on the conversation. This is the beginning of the conversation on equality and that's all I have to say for now.